we have uh, taken ice cores through um, more than a mile of ice in Antarctica, and um, these ice cores contain bubbles of air that are little fossil samples of the atmosphere going back as far as 800,000 years. And uh, we take these ice samples, um, melt them in a vacuum, analyze the bubbles of air, and we get all sorts of wonderful information uh, about uh, the carbon dioxide content, the methane content. We also get things like dust, uh, and we can even get temperature from proxy uh, isotopes that are uh, part of the sample. This is the, so someone's, someone needs to mute. There we go. This is the carbon dioxide record that we have from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica going back 800,000 years. Um, you can see that uh, it contains low points, which we know to be ice ages or cold episodes in Earth's recent climate history, and high points in CO2, which we know to be warm episodes called interglacials. And uh, over the course of this nearly one mil million year record, we never see carbon dioxide concentration rise above 280 parts per million. Uh, of course, until we get into the Anthropocene here, uh, in fact, this past spring, we momentarily hit about 420 parts per million. We've now uh, increased the background level of carbon dioxide uh, in, in the troposphere, the, the lowest layer of the atmosphere that we live in, by 50%, 50 percent, five zero percent above the natural level. Um, but one of the fascinating things about this record uh, is that we see that at least since 500,000 years ago, there's been a regular rhythm to uh, these ice ages and interglacials. And we can, we can actually define an interglacial cycle as being roughly 100,000 years long. Now, this man, Milutin Milankovic, a Serbian engineer, applied Kepler's laws uh, and figured out that uh, three primary uh, orbital, orbital factors in, in Earth's relationship to sunlight control this regular 100,000 year rhythm. Um, the first here is obliquity on the left side. Basically, uh, Earth's axis of rotation tilts towards and away from the sun uh, every 41,000 years. Then we have eccentricity. Eccentricity is that Earth's orbit around the sun goes from uh, more circular to less circular and back to more circular, and it does it on both a 100,000 year and a 400,000 year cycle. And then back to our axis again, it actually draws a circle in the sky and it completes one circle roughly every 26,000 years. Now, what these three orbital parameters do is they control, if this is sunlight and this is uh, the axis of rotation, they tilt uh, the Arctic Circle in the Northern Hemisphere towards and away from the sun, controlling the uh, distribution of sunlight on Earth's surface. And um, they work in such a way that uh, you can develop short cold summers in which the snow from the previous winter does not fully melt. And then year after year, century after century, you expand the amount of reflective albedo or reflective white surface cover during these this period of cold, short summers. And reflecting more and more sunlight begins the process of driving Earth down into an ice age. These orbital parameters can also lead to longer, warmer summers, which pulls back the albedo, pulls back the ice cover, uh, warms the uh, high latitude oceans, both in the Southern hem Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere, and starts to release carbon dioxide and methane from the ocean water. Um, and, and both of these 
come into play in moving Earth from ice ages uh, to interglacials. And our current interglacial is known as the Holocene. And we emerged out of the la last ice age uh, about 21,000 years ago. The orbital parameters that you just saw uh, began to develop longer and warmer summers in the Arctic region. And uh, the amount of snow that would melt every summer increased so that more and more dark uh, Arctic Ocean water and dark uh, continental land was exposed to absorb sunlight uh, and then re-radiate thermal infrared radiation, which is trapped by greenhouse gases. So just the amount of increased thermal infrared radiation helps drive uh, climate out of an ice age state into an interglacial state plus uh, the warming of the high latitude oceans releases more CO2 that was dissolved in the ocean water, which also is a, um, uh, you know, an amplifying feedback effect. Now these orbital parameters maximized this process about 8,000 years ago. And since then, summers in the Arctic have becoming cooler and shorter. And in fact, we have been experiencing natural climate change over this interglacial, uh, which was a function of cooling our way back down to the next ice age, which would be a couple of tens of thousands of years in the future. Of course, now that's all changed and we have left the Holocene interglacial and we are now in the Anthropocene interglacial. We have taken control of uh, climate change. Um, this is the same, uh, basically the same sort of illustration. You can see on the bottom axis here that we have a Holocene, Holocene time scale, starting with about 12,000 years ago on the left side uh, and coming up to present day. Uh, and global mean temperature here uh, on the vertical axis, basically the uh, mid Holocene thermal maximum uh, was on the order of between half a degree to three quarters of a degree warmer than the pre-industrial period. Of course, today we are now 1.1 to 1.2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial period. That difference being, um, uh, you know, uh, the combustion of fossil fuels and, and changes in land use. And this generally, this mid Holocene thermal maximum was on the order of 6,000-ish years ago and things were warmer by about half a degree, maybe a bit more. And as we've already established, planet Earth was cooling its way down towards the next ice age. Until, of course, uh, humans took over. Uh, this is one version of the famous hockey stick. Um, perhaps some of you saw Michael Mann uh, interviewed last week here through a University of Hawaii campus um, special event. He uh, beamed in from Pennsylvania and we had a fascinating hour uh, uh, discussing climate change with him. Uh, by the way, he has come out with a uh, new paper in PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that I can provide you guys the link for um, after the talk, uh, which revisits the hockey stick. And uh, here is a version of the hockey stick that was published uh, by the PAGES 2K Consortium. This was a group of scientists uh, looking at paleoclimate over the last 2000 years, and uh, they published uh, this graph. So that, that was the first point I wanted to make, that we've interrupted natural cooling that was going to take place. Now, the second point I want to make is that we've interrupted sea level fall around the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, in fact, around the equatorial uh, Pacific uh, in general. Now, here's the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago. We had ice centers forming in uh, uh, the northern portion of North America and in Fennoscandia. Uh, here's the Laurenti Laurentide ice sheet and the Cordilleran ice sheet uh, here in North America. These ice sheets were over a mile thick and uh, they depressed the crust, Earth's lithosphere, underneath their enormous weight. They pushed down the continental lithosphere, but around their edges, 
there was an upward flexing that took place called a glacial forebulge. So uh, this is a natural rheological response of a viscoelastic, which is what our uh, lithosphere is. And as you push down under a directed weight, uh, there will be a uh, an upward directed flex uh, in the area peripheral uh, to the direct stress. And we can validate this using a GPS network in North America. If you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see that all the red uh, symbols indicate uplift. So the land, now that the ice has melted, uh, the land is uplifting. And uh, the blue down here uh, south of the border, mostly uh, in the US, is subsidence. And this is the collapse of the glacial forebulge. And here's a model product of the GPS um, uh, velocity network. Uh, you can see all the GPS stations in the in the continental US, and you can see the model product up here in uh, in Canada. Again, uh, red is positive values, which are uplift in millimeters per year, and blue are negative values, which is uh, subsidence of the land um, in millimeters per year as well. And in fact, if you go to coastlines around Hudson Bay uh, or the this, this same process is happening in uh, Norway, General Fenoscandia at large, um, you will find a coastal geomorphology of uplifted storm ridges. These are beach ridges and um, whale bones and seal bones, uh, even lichen. Uh, and other organic materials on uh, rocks in these beach ridges can be radiocarbon dated and they, they show us that at the upper most portion of this field of ridges, we have dates on the order of 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, um, and down here we have, of course, our modern shoreline. So we are rebounding, the land is rebounding up out of uh, the ocean as shown by this field of beach ridges. And here's the vertical land motion for the whole uh, continental region on the planet. You can see this rebound in red um, in millimeters per year for not only uh, North America, uh, but also in Fenoscandia, where the formerly thick um, ice sheets of the Pleistocene Ice Age have been removed and the land is rebounding. Now, what about glacial forebulge uh, collapse? Well, we've deglaciated and now the forebulge is collapsing. Well, where is this land located? It's located in the North Atlantic in blue, the Arctic in blue, and the North Pacific in blue, as well as across the continental US. Here's my second point. The seafloor is lowering around the northern continents that are uplifting. And that lowering seafloor is a deepening mechanism which is pulling water from the far field or the region which is not affected by uh, this flexure. The far field is the equatorial Pacific. And we see here in Hawaii evidence that beginning about 4,000 years ago, this draining of water to fill in the collapsing forebulge around the uplifting continents of the Northern Hemisphere, this draining of water is the equivalent of a sea level fall around Hawaii and other Pacific islands and evidence of stranded shorelines a meter uh, or so, plus or minus half a meter above present sea level uh, is found on many, many Polynesian and Micronesian islands. So sea level fell here in Hawaii uh, before we entered the Anthropocene and it started to rise again, which means coastal plains here like Waimanalo, uh, or any other coastal plain in Hawaii um, 
with the exception of the Big Island, which is subsiding from the weight of the volcano, and also um, hard to find on Maui, which is also subsiding uh, because of the weight of Haleakala. But on Oahu, we have a uh, process that took place over the last 4,000 years of falling sea level, leaving behind carbonate sands uh, that were deposited there over just the last few thousand years, mostly prior to human contact. The type section, if you will, of this process is out in Kapapa Island. Uh, and in fact, this high sea level um, in the mid Holocene or the late mid Holocene is known as the Kapapa Stand of the Sea. And it was named by Harold Stearns before World War II, an early geologist. And what Kapapa Island contains is that you see that bright white line. That is a stranded beach, a stranded beach, and the cobbles and mollusk fragments and coral fragments and sand there all give radiocarbon dates of anywhere from 900 years to up to 3,500 years, 3,800 years ago. Almost impossible to find. In fact, I did not find after dating dozens of samples out here, I did not get a modern date anywhere. So this is not a tsunami deposit. It's not a hurricane storm surge. It is a stranded beach documenting this higher sea level um, from a few thousand years ago. And here's Kauai Nui Marsh, uh, the largest wetland in the state in, in Kailua. Uh, we can do a reconstruction. This is sea level uh, before the high stand. Here is sea level during the high stand. In this case, 3,000 years ago, you can see Kaneohe and Kailua Bays are, uh, there's open flow between the two of them. And uh, now back to present day. All right, so that was uh, the second thing I wanted to mention to you. Keep your Keep your sort of geologic glasses on as you look at habitats and ecologies. For instance, Kaena Point would have been a uh, surf zone 3,000 years ago, perhaps, perhaps 2,000 years ago. Uh, then as sea level fell, uh, the winds take over, they blow the sands into a dune field and you end up with the modern, it's called a strand plain because sea level fall stranded it, but you end up with a dune field, which is essentially what Kaena Point uh, consists of today. But it used to be a shallow, um, a shallow platform washed by, um, washed by the waves. All right, so that was the second point that we have not only uh, interrupted falling temperature on this planet, we have interrupted falling sea level uh, in areas uh, of the tropical Pacific um, through global warming. Now let's get into what most of you thought I was going to be talking about the whole time here, uh, which is modern and projected fuse, uh, sea level rise. We measure uh, the ocean surface through a series of satellite missions, uh, which um, emit a uh, microwave laser uh, that bounces off the ocean surface. This is called satellite altimetry. And um, the record of satellite altimetry began in the early 1990s. It's now um, a couple of decades long. Uh, the overall trend is a rising sea level uh, and the rate is uh, about three and a half millimeters per year. If you look at just the last decade, uh, the rate is up over four millimeters per year. And uh, Steve Neerum published a paper in 2017 or 2018 where if you take this current acceleration rate and project it to the end of the century, uh, we get over two feet of sea level rise by the end of the century under current uh, conditions. This is what the uh, altimetry record looks like if you map it and you can see it shows that some parts of the ocean are accelerating rapidly, other parts of the ocean are, are, are not. Um, a lot of this variability is due to winds uh, pushing water, if you will, and to some degree uh, thermal properties of the water column. The drivers of sea level rise um, are led by thermal expansion of ocean water. Almost half of modern day sea level rise is due to thermal expansion of ocean water. 
We also have loss of ice in Greenland and Antarctica and the world's mountain glaciers. And uh, we have the fact that we are pulling uh, water out of aquifers in the ground, using it largely for agriculture and then um, dispensing it into nearby watersheds and it flows into the ocean. So actually human groundwater mining, if you will, is, is uh, responsible for over 10% of global sea level rise. Another satellite mission is the Gravity Recovery and Climate Exper Experiment follow on. This is the second version of GRACE. Um, GRACE is two units about a quarter mile apart and as they circle the globe, they, uh, these two units separate and return again based on changes in the gravity field as they, as they move and as they, uh, as they uh, move over um, gravity anomalies such as the ice on Greenland, which are changing, they record the changing gravity and we'll get to that record in a minute. So this is a map of the global temperature change relative to the average, and it shows several things. One is that the oceans are colder than the air, than the average air. Uh, continents are warmer than the average air temperature. Um, and Arctic, the Arctic region is warming faster, in, in fact, two to three times faster than other parts of the planet. This is called Arctic amplification. It has to do with the retreat of sea ice. And um, Greenland, of course, is in the Arctic and it is melting rapidly. It is spilling fresh water into the North Atlantic. Uh, and uh, we, we now have the coldest temperatures in the North Atlantic since uh, Ben Franklin began to measure them um, back during the colonial era. This is the uh, mass of Greenland um, and the uh, change in mass is negative. It's losing about 280 billion tons per year. Uh, this is in the form of ice that is melting, uh, either melting in place or, or melting when it flows into the ocean, when it calves into the ocean. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet is in a constant state of loss. And uh, even if climate change stopped, the ice sheet would still be losing mass. But in addition to this uh, fresh water, um, this cold fresh water, it is also slowing down the conveyor belt, which is a system of currents, uh, surface currents that transport heat out of the Pacific and Indian into the Atlantic. Uh, and the conveyor belt in the Atlantic has slowed about 15 to 18%, and it is not pulling as much heat from the South Atlantic uh, as it would normally. And the the South Atlantic and the Southern Ocean uh, are seeing heat buildup, which is driving accelerated melting in Antarctica, um, principally in the area of West Antarctica here uh, in dark red. This is from a sea level point of view, probably the most important location on the planet because as uh, Pine Island, which is the three upper panels and Freights Glacier, uh, the two lower panels, as these accelerate into the ocean, um, over the last decade, they've been flowing at about three kilometers per year into the ocean, but over the last two years, they've been flowing at five kilometers per year into the ocean. As these accelerate, uh, they hold the potential for multimeter sea level rise this century. Um, the physics are complex and we're not able to model them, so uh, we don't truly have the ability to project um, what these uh, ice streams uh, will do. There are three other major ice streams in West Antarctica. Um, and as they accelerate, we need to be prepared for multimeter sea level rise this century and certainly next century. But as the map shows you, the oceans are colder than the air. Uh, the oceans are absorbing heat from the air uh, and the conveyor belt circulation will take that heat down uh, to lower levels of the ocean water column. That process, uh, the assimilation of this warm surface water down through the entire water column and across the entire ocean is over a thousand year long process. And even if we were to stop global warming today at the current temperature, the oceans would still take a thousand years, in fact, more than a thousand years 
uh, to equilibrate to the air temperature. And um, one paper came out earlier this year which said if we want to stop the melting in Antarctica, we need to lower the CO2 content beyond the pre-industrial level. We need to lower CO2 to 280 parts per million or less in order to stop the melting of, of Antarctica. I haven't seen a paper specific to Greenland, um, but basically these, these global scale systems, the melting of Greenland, the melting of Antarctica, and the thermal expansion of the ocean, these are in play forever from a human lifetime point of view. Here is the uh, history of heat in the ocean. And uh, the oceans have absorbed more than 90% of the heat that has been trapped by fossil fuel combustion and land use changes uh, by the enhanced greenhouse effect. Um, and in the process, also absorbed carbon dioxide so that we have ocean acidification, we have thermal expansion of sea level, uh, driving almost half of sea level rise, and we have um, sea surface temperatures rising. Um, these, these three aspects of the ocean um, are, are caused by our uh, combustion of fossil fuels. We are also losing the world's alpine glaciers, and you can see here uh, from the GRACE satellite, uh, the, these seven uh, records that I've put in here, but we have records for um, 14 or 15 different uh, alpine glacier systems in this particular paper. Combined, uh, we have about the same amount of mass loss or ice melting uh, from the world's alpine glaciers as we do from Greenland alone, about 280 billion tons per year. And here is uh, groundwater depletion, which we've already mentioned. All right, so in AR6, Assessment Report 6 that just came out in August from the latest IPCC, um, we have uh, model projections uh, for future carbon dioxide emissions, for future temperatures as a response uh, to those emissions and other greenhouse gases. Uh, the modeling now no longer focuses on uh, the RCP or representative concentration profile but uh, or pathway, but looking at shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs. SSP 2-4.5, uh, which is shown in the red circle here, um, is an intermediate scenario where CO2 emissions at remain at current levels until about mid-century and then they fall social, economic, and technological trends are similar to historical patterns, um, and we're looking at end of century temperatures just short of about three degrees Celsius. Another one here is SSP 3-7.0. CO2 emissions double by the end of the century. Uh, the socioeconomic system on Earth is characterized by nationalism, a focus on border security, internal food and energy security. Uh, there's intensive continued consumption of natural resources. Um, we're looking at over three degrees C temperature rise by the end of the century. Now, unfortunately, uh, the latest assessment report did not provide model solutions for the most likely pathway, which uh, is SSP 2-3-6.0. Um, this is the likely pathway that uh, humanity is on now someplace between two and a half and three and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, this is still the case, even with the latest reports of the national um, pledges to reduce greenhouse gases uh, consistent with the Paris uh, Accord in 2015, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Um, the actual policies, the reality of national uh, combustion and land use is putting on us on a pathway of someplace between two and a half and maybe three degrees Celsius. So what does the sea level rise look like for these by the end of the century? Here are the different SSPs clustered on the right hand side of the graph. Um, seven to 4.5, we're someplace in between those. 
and uh, it's just short of one meter. Um, yet uh, AR6 does uh, provide a discussion of this low likelihood, but very high impact storyline, they call it. This is uh, ice sheet instability, uh, largely in West Antarctica, which would be a sea level rise exceeding SSP 5-8.5. So that's a dashed line there that is going up into multimeter sea level rise this century. So we basically have two stories here, um, somewhat less than one meter, but potentially multimeter by the end of the century. All right, well, this, the story is somewhat different depending on where you are. And uh, there's a process called sea level fingerprinting, which is important for Hawaii. Uh, you know, Greenland and Antarctica and even the world's mountain glaciers, those bodies of ice exert a gravitational field, which will pull uh, the local ocean water towards them. So there's this gravitational attraction that the sea level has in the in the region around these large ice bodies and as these ice bodies melt their gravity their mass decreases their gravitational attraction decreases and that sea level attraction is released so around these ice bodies you get a sea level rise which is less than the global average and far away you get a compensating sea level rise which is more than the global average and we're located far away and here are the solutions for um, the greenland ice sheet you can see that hawaii is in the dark red region here this is uh, where as the sea level fingerprint related to the melting of the Greenland ice sheet uh, is modeled. Hawaii is in the worst case zone. Uh, we are also in the worst zone with regard to the West Antarctic um, ice sheet, the East Antarctic ice sheet, and then a median solution for all the world's alpine glaciers. So um, for a global average sea level rise of one meter, we can expect to see something more than one meter, 1.3 meters. Uh, and for this number of 3.2 feet of sea level rise, which is what was projected by AR5 in 2013, the IPCC uh, report uh, about eight years ago, uh, the maximum uh, for RCP 8.5, the maximum model sea level rise for that report was 98 centimeters, which is 3.2 feet. We can expect to see about 4.3 feet. So where does that all leave us? Well, plan for four feet of sea level rise by the end of the century, but there's a lot of uncertainty about that. And so how do we manage this uncertainty? Uh, NOAA, in a report by Billy Sweet et al. in 2017, provides us with some scenarios, six scenarios for planning. Now, these two lowest scenarios of the low and the intermediate low do not take us to the more than two feet of sea level rise that the current rate of acceleration of global sea level rise will produce. So I consider these two scenarios, low and intermediate low, um, out of date. We are at least going to see a little more than two feet of sea level rise and probably a good planning horizon is on the order of one meter or um, considering sea level fingerprinting locally here in Hawaii, four feet. Now, NOAA suggests that you choose a scenario, five feet, six and a half or eight feet based on whatever your project is. If you are building a nuclear power plant in the coastal zone, you can't afford to get it wrong. You have very low tolerance for risk. You should plan for multimeter sea level rise. You should plan for 8.2 feet. In fact, more. If you're uh, rearranging your beachfront furniture on your backyard, uh, you can tolerate sea level rise. So plan for uh, one meter of sea level rise. You can tolerate a lot of risks. So based on the risk tolerance of your project, um, you can choose one of these scenarios. And um, NOAA provides uh, decadal 
schedule of sea level rise for each scenario. So you can get a number of how much sea level rise under the intermediate high scenario for the year 2070, for the decade 2070, for example. But sea level rise is actually, uh, it behaves not just in this exponentially accelerating uh, manner, uh, it also consists of king tides, which we have begun to see. Uh, these king tides are the highest tides of the year. Uh, they can they can be uh, purely a lunar phenomenon twice a year, uh, early in the calendar year and then uh, late in the summer or in the midsummer. Uh, but they can be aided and abetted, if you will, by onshore winds, uh, by a, a swell event that sets up sea level on the coast, uh, by thermal expansion in the summertime because of the warm air, seasonal uh, expansion. But in any case, these, these uh, king tides arrive decades before the permanent inundation. Um, and uh, as we go through time, as we proceed into the next decade and the decades beyond, they occur with greater and greater frequency. So a king tide that is say one foot above mean high or high water today, um, which may have occurred only a few times several years ago, actually by mid-century will be occurring every day. It will be the new mean high or high water, if you will, and there will be some new king tide uh, above that one. And this is what king tides look like, right? Uh, this is in Waikiki. Uh, you know, our drainage system in our urban areas uh, takes runoff. Um, the road is crowned and sloped. Uh, runoff will go down to the gutters. It'll go into a culvert uh, and then into a pipe, which will take it either into a drainage canal. Uh, the Alawai is one, but we have other drainage canals uh, throughout the urban area uh, or straight out to the ocean in this case. Here we are in Mapunapuna. This is a drainage canal that flows into uh, Kehi Lagoon. And actually the water coming up here has uh, been shown by, by um, uh, a couple of researchers here at the university in the Department of Earth Sciences is a combination of groundwater as well as saltwater. And in fact, freshwater uh, rain that is floating on top of the saltwater. And we have this phenomenon of groundwater inundation. Uh, this is an excavation in Waikiki. We know that the water table underlying the urban core, uh, in fact, the water table under all of our low-lying coastal plain regions goes up and down with the tides. And if it goes up and down with the tides, it's going to go up with global sea level rise. So, a water table that breaks through the land surface creates what's known as a wetland. And these wetlands uh, are only two feet of sea level rise away from forming. Two feet is the elevation of the water table under Waikiki and parts of uh, Kaka'ako uh, during the highest tide of the year uh, in the summertime where you get some thermal expansion um, of the water column. When will two feet of sea level rise occur? Well, currently one foot of sea level rise is sort of on track for mid-century. Two feet would be a couple of decades after that, but before the end of the century. You federal scientists, what is a federal, what is a, a, a wetland? It's a, isn't that a protected ecosystem? How do wetlands map onto uh, the resort economy of Waikiki? Now let's rain on top of that, uh, because one of the characteristics of a warmer atmosphere is that you get more intense rainfall separated by longer and more intense drought. Uh, this was during the El Nino of 2015-2016. This is Dillingham Boulevard. Uh, this is late in the day with the highest tide of the day. We have two high tides a day. That's the highest of which is typically in the late afternoon in the summertime around Honolulu. Uh, so the water table is high, the ocean level is high, 
Uh, it backs up the storm drains. There's no dry soil to absorb rainwater, and so it has no place to go. We basically have no drainage throughout most of the um, uh, primary urban core from Diamond Head to Pearl Harbor. And uh, this is also the time of day when uh, people are trying to leave the urban area, get back to their families, pick up their kids at daycare and at summer school, um, and, and let you know teachers go home uh, to get back home and to, uh, to join family members, perhaps the elderly, perhaps the ill who've been waiting all day and need help, they need food. They, um, we also have during El Nino's, we have these incredibly hot days. And, and all that is broken. Our society is fractured by these events, these, these flood events. And there's a sea level component, there's an intense rainfall component, there's a drainage component. All of this needs to be managed. And we've, we've modeled some of this in my research group. Um, this is the South Shore, this is Eva Beach. Um, if you take the average high wave of the year, which would be, you know, a swell event arriving from the southern hemisphere. You'd grab your board and you go surfing. Uh, if you take that wave and you raise sea level two feet, this is how that wave uh, washes up into Eva Beach. Uh, but if you raise sea level three feet, you pass some sort of topographic tipping point here. And we see this again and again, someplace between two and three feet of sea level rise the ocean suddenly gains a lot of access to the flat topography of the coastal plain. And, uh, you know, this is every summer. This is not a hurricane storm surge. This is not a tsunami. This is seasonal swell, fully expected every summer. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at the modeling uh, that was done by Dr. Shelley Habel, who's with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant program. Shelley did this modeling uh, as part of her, of her dissertation for her PhD. She has modeled the water table, uh, the drainage, um, and the overland flow of seawater across the coast in three different colors. Now, what you see here is uh, a few pink dots. These are individual uh, storm drains, which are blocked by seawater, according to the model. Uh, the purple is the water table, uh, not connected to the ocean. Uh, green uh, is drainage that's connected to the ocean. And uh, blue, little bits of blue here, um, are uh, the ocean flowing across the land. So here is one foot of sea level rise at high tide. Here then is two feet of sea level rise at high tide. You see flooding in green related to storm drain backflow, our drainage system flooding onto the land in green. Uh, you see pink dots indicating uh, storm drains which are inoperable because they are filled with salt water from the ocean. And now you also see some red lines. These indicate roads that have more than six inches of standing water which is a transportation engineering uh, rule of thumb, uh, a small vehicle will create a bow wave moving through six inches that will, that will curl back into the engine compartment and potentially uh, shut down the car. So you have, a, you have a flooded street with a stalled vehicle. Basically, that, uh, that street is no longer passable. So this is a two feet of sea level rise, and here's that, here's that tipping point again between two and three feet of sea level rise. We're basically shutting down roads. We're creating flooding of multiple types all through Waikiki, uh, Mo'ili Ili, Kaka'ako. Uh, in fact, we find it through the whole urban core. And of course, sea level is not going to stop at three feet. We have four feet and five feet as well. This is at high tide. Erosion is a huge problem, uh, which accelerates with sea level rise. And uh, we've modeled erosion. Uh, the red line is the 80% probability of land loss, if you will, uh, or erosion. Um, landward of which you have a 80% probability of not experiencing erosion. Um, this uh, model, uh, uh, um, 
provides a, an erosion projection uh, every 20 meters along the shoreline. And in in uh, blue here is the wave run up on the North Shore. This is uh, in the Sunset Beach area uh, again for 3.2 feet of sea level rise. And um, our research on coastal erosion, annual highway flooding and then passive flooding. Uh, if you combine all these areas that are exposed to these sea level rise hazards, you create an exposure zone, the sea level rise exposure area. Uh, this this is a mappable GIS layer, which is now being used or considered for use by uh, the various counties here in Hawaii and, and is used by the state as well for permit considerations. Uh, you can access these data on the PAC IUS uh, Hawaii Sea Level Rise Viewer. And there's menu there on the right side. And this is my last slide. Um, this is from the new IPCC report, global mean sea level will continue to rise for thousands of years, even if future CO2 emissions are reduced to net zero and global warming is halted. So uh, this problem can be managed. It can't be stopped, um, but we won't manage it effectively if we wait until the last minute. OK, I'll end with that. Thank you.